are very fortunate to have him. He's currently visiting Los Angeles. Sorry, I don't mean to turn my back. He's visiting Los Angeles from Vrindavan. That's where he stays. He was based in Govardhan, and he's currently living in Vrindavan with his wife. His wife is right there in Vrindavan, and her name is Shrivoti. She was originally from Los Angeles until the album stole her away from us. <laughs> so we are very, very delighted to have you, Prabhu. And uh, Prabhu will be giving a class. And uh, prominently, we will be having a Q&A session. So please feel free to ask any questions that are burning in your mind or without you, you know, the Gita, Bhagavatam, anything quite to solve the questions to each other. That's a pretty hard introduction to live up to. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or any topic that you'd like to hear about? Anything in particular? Even kid questions are okay. <laughs> okay. So nobody has any questions. <laughs> Anything you'd like to hear about? Any topic from Bhagavad Gita? We can talk about Lord Jagannath. Lord Jagannath. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll talk about Lord Jagannath. Since Snan Yatra is coming up tomorrow, as you know, every year in Jagannath Puri, Lord Jagannath is bathed uh, in public. Everyone can come and see that. It's a famous ceremony, Snan Yatra. Abhishek is performed. And uh, it's outside. And so, generally every year, Jagannath catches a cold. I don't know how it's been going on like this for thousands of years, and they don't seem to be able to prevent it. <laughs> it must be his transcendental desire. When he wants to get sick, in order to facilitate more devotees rendering more service, then he can do that if he wants. That's the nature of God. But uh, we'll be celebrating that tomorrow at the Iskon Temple in Los Angeles. And... After Snanyatra, Jagannath goes into seclusion because he has caught a transcendental cold and at that time Pujaris take advantage of the opportunity to make renovations to the deity because Jagannath deity is after all fashioned out of wood. And then once the Lord agrees to manifest as that form, then of course he's considered <coughs> to be such an Ananda Vigraha, but still he acts like wood. <laughs> and this is the transcendental Achinche Veda Veda Tattva, they call it in philosophical language. He can be wood and spirit at the same time. So, for two weeks he's in seclusion, that's called Anavasara, when you don't have an opportunity to see the Lord. And then he'll finally make his triumphant appearance at Venice Beach on August 3rd of this year. And hundreds of thousands of people will come and take advantage of his darshan that he's freely giving to everyone. You all know Rathiyatra, big, big festival, famous festival. It actually commemorates the occasion of Lord Krishna coming to Kurukshetra 5,000 years ago during his pastimes on this planet. And he took advantage of the solar eclipse to bathe at Kurukshetra and perform sacrifices and charity and austerities at Kurukshetra because you get more benefit when it's at that time. So, but for the gopis, those devotees of Krishna's who were completely above all these ritualistic considerations, their only motive was to go and see him because they knew he would be there. He had left Vrindavan and gone to faraway Dwarka and they were pining in his absence. They were heartbroken. For so many years they couldn't see him. And therefore their only thought was to go back to Kurukshetra and somehow or other, if they could, bring him back to Vrindavan. So that's Rathiyatra, at least that's how it's explained by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Is that okay? Anything else? Other questions? Well, I have a question. Please. <coughs> uh, particularly in India, it's, it's a polytheistic society where a large number of demigods are also worshipped, which is perfectly okay, but could you please elaborate the position of the demigods with regard to Krishna? And in what mood should we be worshipping the demigods? So the question is, in what mood shall we <coughs> worship demigods, or shall we view the demigods, maybe? Probably, how do we view the demigods? Yeah, vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. 
Uh, actually, Srila Prabhupada has talked about this in several places in his commentaries, and in the Bhagavad Gita itself, also Krishna has mentioned the Devatas several times. It's noteworthy that maybe in the half dozen places that I can think of off the top of my head in which Krishna talks about Devatas, he's not very discouraging. He actually, you know, he, it's a recognized thing. But there are a few considerations that we have to keep in mind here. So I'm going to read, first of all, from chapter 4, text number 12 of the Bhagavad Gita. It's a well-known verse. <clears throat> there Krishna says, Kangshanta karmanam siddhim yajanta eh devataha kshipram himano she loke siddhir bhaviti karmaja Translation is, men in this world desire success in fruitive activities and therefore they worship the demigods. Quickly, of course, men get results from fruit of work in this world. Now here's the purport by Srila Prabhupada, which puts this into the context that you're seeking, I think. He says, There is a great misconception about the gods or demigods of this material world. And men of less intelligence, although passing as great scholars, take these demigods to be various forms of the Supreme Lord. Actually, the demigods are not different forms of God but they are God's different parts and parcels. God is one, and the parts and parcels are many. The Vedas say, Nityo Nityana, God is one. Ishwara Paramaha Krishnaha, the Supreme God is one, Krishna. And the demigods are delegated with powers to manage this material world. These demigods are all living entities. Nityana, that means eternal living beings with different grades of material power. They cannot be equal to the Supreme God, Narayan, Vishnu, or Krishna. Anyone who thinks that God and the demigods are on the same level is called an atheist, or Pashandi. Even the great demigods like Brahma and Shiva cannot be compared to the Supreme Lord. In fact, the Lord is worshipped by demigods such as Brahma and Shiva. Shiva Virinchinutan which is what that means. Yet, curiously enough, there are many human leaders who are worshipped by foolish men under the misunderstanding of anthropomorphism or zoomorphism. Iha devataha denotes a powerful man or demigod of this material world. But Narayan, Vishnu or Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, does not belong to this world. He is above or transcendental to the material creation. Even Sripad Shankaracharya, the leader of the impersonalists, maintains that Narayana or Krishna is beyond this material creation. However, foolish people, Hrithagyan, worship the demigods because they want immediate results. They get the results, but do not know that the results are so obtained are temporary and are meant for less intelligent persons. The intelligent person is in Krishna consciousness, and he has no need to worship the paltry demigods for some immediate temporary benefit. The demigods of this material world, as well as their worshippers, will vanish with the annihilation of this material world. The boons of the demigods are material and temporary. Both the material worlds and their inhabitants, including the demigods and their worshippers, are bubbles in the cosmic ocean. In this world, however, human society is mad after temporary things such as the material opulence of possessing land, family, and enjoyable paraphernalia. To achieve such temporary things, people worship the demigods or powerful men in human society. Bookmark that. We'll return to it in a moment. If a man gets some ministership in the government by worshipping a political leader, he considers that he has achieved a great boon. All of them are therefore kowtowing to the so-called leaders or quote-unquote big guns <laughs> in order to achieve temporary boons. And they, are indeed, and they indeed achieve such things. Such foolish men are not interested in Krishna consciousness for the permanent solution to the hardships of material existence. They are all after sense enjoyment, and to get a little facility for sense enjoyment, 
they are attracted to worshipping empowered living entities known as demigods. This verse indicates that people are rarely interested in Krishna consciousness, they are mostly interested in material enjoyment, and therefore they worship some powerful living entity. Now I'm going to skip ahead to chapter 7 in which Krishna continues in the same vein, uh, <coughs> on the same topic. Just after saying that after many births and deaths, one who is actually full in knowledge surrenders unto me. Anybody know the verse? Bhumunam? You know. Then he says, Kamais tais tairhrita jnana prapadyante anya devataha tam tam niyamam asthaya prakritya niyataha svaya Srila Prabhupada had quoted this verse in his previous purport, that's why I jumped to it. So here, this means, those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. So here in the purport, Srila Prabhupada continues, he says, less intelligent people who have lost their spiritual sense take shelter of demigods for immediate fulfillment of material desires. Generally, such people do not go to the Supreme Personality of Godhead because they are in the lower modes of nature, ignorance and passion, and therefore worship various demigods. <laughs> Following the rules and regulations of worship, they are satisfied. The worshippers of demigods are motivated by small desires and do not know how to reach the supreme goal. But a devotee of the Supreme Lord is not misguided, because in Vedic literature there are recommendations for worshipping different gods for different purposes. For example, a diseased man is recommended to worship the sun. Those who are not devotees of the Lord think that for certain purposes demigods are better than the Supreme Lord. But a pure devotee knows that the Supreme Lord Krishna is the master of all. Does Krishna say this in Bhagavad Gita? Where does he say this? Everything comes from me, where else? Well, that's the same thing. <laughs> where else does he say this? Okay, yeah, nobody's thinking of the verse that I'm thinking of, but... Um, Krishna says, Bhoktaram yajnata basam sarva loka maheshwaram suridam sarva bhutanam There are three things you can want in this world. <laughs> you can want someone who loves you, you can want someone who is, has some aishwarya or the, you know, the capability of an ishwara, somebody who has control, someone who has pull, as we say. Or you can be interested in somebody who is uh, a first class enjoyer and who can teach you how to do the same thing. This is what we seek in this world. So Krishna says, I'm each of those three categories, I'm the topmost. Of all the controllers, I'm the topmost. Of all the enjoyers, I'm the topmost. And of all the friends, I'm the topmost. You see? It, it's implicitly, he says there, that uh, of all the devatas. But elsewhere, he also says, all these devatas actually come from me. There are his parts and parcels, as we, we've already heard that. So, uh, then he says, endowed with such a faith, faith, he endeavors to worship a particular god, demigod, and obtains his desires. But in actuality, these benefits are bestowed by me alone. Purport, the demigods cannot award benedictions to their devotees without the permission of the Supreme Lord. The living entity may forget that everything is the property of the Supreme Lord, but the demigods do not forget. <laughs> so the worship of demigods and achievement of desired results are not due to the demigods, but to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By arrangement, the less intelligent living entity does not know this, and therefore he foolishly goes to the demigods for some benefit. But the pure devotee, when in need of something, prays only to the Supreme Lord. Asking for a material benefit, however, is not the sign of a pure devotee. A living entity goes to the demigods usually because he's mad to fulfill his lust. This happens when something undue is desired by the living entity, and the Lord himself does not fulfill the desire.
So then Krishna says something very strong in the next verse. Antavatu phalam tesham tad bhavati alpamet hasam devan devayajo yanti madbhakta yanti mamati. Men of small intelligence worship the demigods and their fruits are limited and temporary. Those who worship the demigods go to the planets of the demigods, but my devotees ultimately reach my supreme planet. Sometimes commentators say, or so-called <coughs> spiritual teachers say, that whatever path you take, it's all the same thing. It's all equal. All, lo all, all roads lead to Rome. Is that true when you go to the Los Angeles International Airport? You can get any ticket and get on any plane and you'll go to Mumbai? No. If your plane is going to Moscow, you're not going to Mumbai. <laughs> you're going to Moscow. And there's a big difference between Moscow and Mumbai, in some ways. <laughs> so it's really not like that. And in the cosmic scale, in the macrocosm, it's also like that. Krishna says, if you, if you do something spiritual, you will get a spiritual result. If you're doing something material, you'll get a material result. <laughs> Last night they showed us a movie, old, old Hindi movie, uh, Malik. Anybody seen this movie? Anyway, it's, uh, who are the actors? Srimurti, she knows these things better than I. <laughs> you can ask me about Bhagavad Gita, you can ask her about movies. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I won't embarrass you. <laughs> anyway, so there was a woman in the mo in movies, so she saw that one, one devotee had worshipped Krishna very faithfully, and Krishna made him rich. So she thought, well, he's giving, you know, he's offering incense every day to Krishna, so I'm going to get 10,000 rupees worth of incense and offer that, and we'll see what he does for me. <laughs> and sure enough, she got what she wanted. Somebody came, stumbled at the temple steps and dropped a briefcase full of money. Dollar bills, hundred dollar bills. She picked it up and she was going out and spending lavishly until the police came and told her that this money is all counterfeit. <laughs> counterfeit bhakti, counterfeit result. <laughs> <laughs> so there are material reasons that people worship and there are spiritual reasons that people worship. So we have to be conscious of that first of all. And Krishna says, antavat, antavat, those things that have an end. It's less intelligent to chase after them. It's less intelligent. This is the whole idea here. So, the demigods... Yeah, here, here the point may be raised. This is a... In Sanskrit commentaries, we get this thing. You know, nanuetat bhavati, you know, tarhietat syat. If you have one particular doubt, then you raise your doubt. So, Prabhupada is raising what we call a purva pakshi, the first objection. The first objection is this. If the demigods are different parts of the body of the Supreme Lord, then the same end should be achieved by worshipping them. Right? If the demigods are just part, different parts of the Supreme Lord's body, then it's, you're, ultimately it's going to go to the Supreme, right? I won't embarrass you. You don't have to answer. So Srila Prabhupada answers, and I'll just summarize here. He answers very in a very smart way. He said, you cannot stuff foodstuffs into any orifice of your body. It only goes here. If you put it, if you try to jam it into your ear, you get a massive infection. <laughs> if you try to put it in any other orifice, I'll leave it to your imagination. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. There are certain persons who are authorized to accept certain things and certain persons are authorized to accept other things. And yes, it's true. In the Vedic literature we find that there is some dispensation given, some sanction given, for those who are so, I don't want to say hell-bent, but maybe heaven-bent on uh, getting what they want in this world right now, in this life. So for those people who are going to do anything and everything to get what they want anyway, it's better that they worship somebody who is at least an authorized representative of the Lord and get it from them. But it is not encouraged. And the reason it is not encouraged is because, as Krishna says here, Anybody else can think of where Krishna says something very similar? 
things that have enjoyments that have a, an, a beginning and an end. Adhyanta vanta kantaya nateshu ramate buddhaha. The intelligent people, Gambhivo deva dasyanti yantni bhavitaha. Tair dattana pradaya ipyo yobhunkte stena evasa. Strong words. He says, the demigods being pleased by sacrifice. He's, he's been talking about the necessity of living a life of sacrifice. Anybody who hasn't figured out that you don't really get anywhere in life without sacrificing, this, this is for you, this section. So here Krishna says, the demigods being pleased by sacrifices will also please you. And thus, by cooperation between men and demigods, prosperity will reign for all. This is what Adam Smith tried to call the invisible hand of capitalist markets. It actually doesn't work like that in capitalism, but it does work, work like that in the world of yajna, better known as the world of karmakanda. Karma means actually dharma. Strictly speaking, karma means dharma. Ritual action for the propitiation of the gods. General process. If one is a materialist, this is what one can do, and one will live happy in this world like that. So Krishna says, he goes on here, in charge of the various necessities of life, like water, we finally got some rain this afternoon. After how many years of drought? Isn't it? I used to live in Temecula when I was caring for my mother many years ago. And every, I mean here also, you know very well, is that just look at the mountainside behind, outside the window. It's black. <laughs> Every year, the, half the state, it seems, burns down from these wildfires because he's hungry. If you don't give up me something to eat, he's going to steal it. <laughs> You're stealing everything from him and not giving him anything in return, so he's going to take what he wants. He has to eat the weeds. We're not offering grains in the sacrifice, so he's eating weeds every year in Southern California. Anyway, <clears throat> so they will supply all necessities to you, but... He who enjoys these things without offering them in return is a thief. Krishna, yo pungte, the person who enjoys these things independently, stena evasa. He's only, he's simply a thief. Very strong words. So, Srila Prabhupada goes on in his purport in chapter seven, text twenty-three. The results achieved by the demigods' benedictions are perishable because within this material world, the planets, the demigods, and their worshippers are, are, are all perishable. We've read this before. Uh, the same ideas are being continued here. So, then in chapter 9, he says a few more things, and I'll just I'll end after that. Very uh, interesting verses here. He's talking about those who, by living a life of sacrifice, piety, karma, and actually go up to the heavenly planets called Svargaloka after this life. They're elevated to the Beverly Hills of the cosmic manifestation, you might say. Um, but they have to fall down again because eventually they run out of credit. <laughs> it's, it's karma, the system of karma is just debits and credits. It's just like your, your, your credit card. You have to maintain a very, you know, good pattern of, of, of financial behavior and then everything's okay. But as soon as you get irresponsible, then, then it, all, it all finishes very quickly. So they come back again. Um, and he says here, Implicitly, stuck within this, the middle of this discussion about Karma Kanda, the results of worshiping demigods, he sticks this verse as if to suggest that it's better just to depend on me because I will give you everything you need if you worship me. Everybody knows this verse? Ananyash Chintayantamam. Shall I read the translation? Raise your hand if you want to hear. Okay. But those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them, I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. This is Krishna's promise. Then he says this. Ye pianya devata bhakta, yajante shratayan vitaha, tepi ma neva kontaya, yajantiya vidhi purvakam. Interesting thing. Those who are devotees of other gods and who worship them with faith actually worship only me, O son of Kunti. But they do so in a wrong way. Now, Krishna himself, in chapter 15, tells us what about his relationship to the Vedas? 
1515. He said, only, I'm only the one who's written these Vedas. And within the Vedas, we've already described, there are injunctions given how to worship the Devatas. And yet here Krishna is making a very strong statement. What does he say? Yajanti avidhi purvakam. It's not vidhi purvakam. Vidhi purvakam means it's according to lawfully, licit. <laughs> avidhi purvakam means illicit. This is illicit worship. <laughs> so it's a very, very interesting thing he says. Let's hear what, what the purport says. Krishna says, persons who are engaged in worship of demigods are not very intelligent, although such worship is offered to me indirectly. We've already discussed that. For example, when a man pours water on the leaves and branches of a tree without pouring water on the root, he does so without sufficient knowledge or without observing regulative principles. Similarly, the process of rendering service to different parts of the body is to supply food to the stomach. The demigods are, so to speak, different officers and directors in the government of the Supreme Lord. One has to follow the laws made by the government, not by the officers or directors. Similarly, everyone is to offer his worship to the Supreme Lord only. That will automatically satisfy the different officers and directors of the Lord. Now here's something that every Indian will recognize. The officers and directors are engaged as representatives of the government and to offer some bribe to the officers <laughs> and directors is illegal, especially if you talk to Arvind Kejriwal. <laughs> At least he claims like that. That, that is stated here as avidhi purvakam. You get the idea. Iti bhava, as we say in the Sanskrit commentaries. This is stated here as avidhi purvakam. This is what he means. To worship a demigod as if he were independently uh, the authorized agent to supply you what you need uh, is, is in effect to, to bribe one of the lower officers within the mid-level man management of the cosmic manifestation. Therefore, I call it material Hinduism. When I went to Mauritius, if you visit Mauritius, anybody been there? Raise your hand if you know Mauritius. No. <laughs> Only myself and my wife, it seems. So, many, 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 many temples, everywhere temples, they don't call them temples there, they call them shivalayas, but they have all the deities, all of them, every temple. Very, very difficult to find a temple exclusively devoted to only Vishnu. You can find some that are only for Shiva, and most of them have pretty much everybody, you see? People are very, very attached to worshipping Devatas in Mauritius, more so even than in India, except maybe in the south. There's a little more there also. So why? If you talk to them, they will admit to you the, the reason we worship these Devatas is because we want things and they give us things. Right? If somebody else comes along, then I'll worship that person too. Therefore we see Sai Baba temples have sprung up now. Right? It's the same principle. Therefore, Prabhupada said a moment ago, Devata means a powerful man or a demigod. You see? Anybody you need to get your thing from, you can, you talk to, you get in good with your boss and you get what they call PB in Mauritius, political backing, then, you know, you can get what your desire will be fulfilled. See, but this is not only pure, impure motivation, but it's actually akin to bribing a government official. And this is, this is why Krishna says here, Yajantiya Vidhi Purvakam. In other words, Krishna does not approve unnecessary worship of the demigods. Why unnecessary? We've already described that if we want the necessities of life in chapter 3, Krishna himself described, you go to, you worship these devas and offer them whatever. So why is it unnecessary? Those who are listening carefully should know by now, because we've recited this verse, Ityadi. Krishna tells us, if you just surrender to me, you worship me, I will supply everything that you need. It's not necessary to go and bribe the mid-level guys. You see? Question? What would you, um, many times when you approach somebody who is following demigods, 
and and you mentioned about Krishna and like um, um, give a little uh, feedback or explanation of Krishna Bhagwan why you should surrender. But then the four regulatory principles when you lay that down, that's where they put their hands back. So that's too much. Krishna himself does does not insist on following the vows that those initiated members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness take. Anyone familiar with chapter 12 in Bhagavad Gita? You probably know what I'm thinking. Uh, in the beginning half of the chapter, Krishna says, first of all, Mayeva mana adhatsva. You just fix your mind only on me. That's his, that's his primary preference. That's the, that's, the, that's the best thing you can do. You see? Just engage your intelligence in me. You will come up, you will always, you will be good, no problem. But, If you cannot fix your mind very strongly in that way, then abhyasa yogena tato mamit chatum dhyandaya. Then just do something, you know, practice the regular principles as much as you can, in effect, is, is what he's saying. Now, he goes on further. If even in that practice you're still unable to do that also, then then just do something for me. <laughs> do anything for me. You will become perfect if you do something for me. This is what Krishna says. And then he goes on even further. Even if you can't do that, If you're unable to work in this consciousness of me, then try to act giving up all the results of your work and try to be self-situated. If you cannot take to this practice, then engage yourself in the cultivation of knowledge. Better than knowledge, however, is meditation, and better than meditation is renunciation of the fruits of action. For by such renunciation one can attain peace of mind. So Krishna is giving us several options here. It doesn't look to me as if Krishna is saying that you have to immediately surrender everything, and that's there's no... I mean, he's giving quite a few different plans here. Mm-hmm. You see? However, we have to have the humility and the intelligence and honesty to recognize that these plans are not all equal. If someone is giving everything to Krishna, that is a greater sacrifice than somebody who just tries to do something for Krishna once in a while. You see? Therefore, we give respect to everyone. And therefore, I said in the beginning, Krishna himself acknowledges the validity of worshipping devatas for those who are on that level. Because for those people, it's the only link they have with any authority. Why discourage that? Sometimes in ISKCON there are people who, uh, you know, very strong on this point of demigod worship. I personally don't like to discourage it, because at least people are doing something and they are recognizing the authority of the Vedas. It's for that purpose that Shankaracharya incarnated After India was overrun with Bodha philosophy, nobody even accepted the Vedas. So Shankaracharya came and he preached something that the Padma Purana calls Prachanna Bodha, you know, veiled Buddhism. But at least he got them to respect the authority of the Vedas. So if a person does that, Krishna says, Siddhimavapsyati, he will also attain perfection. You see? Is that all right? But we should actually understand this thing very clearly. And, and actually you'd be surprised that even the Karmakani pundits, many of them do understand. In Mauritius I spoke to one gentleman, and his father was one such pundit. So he was telling me that actually they, they know everything. <laughs> These pundits, they know everything. They know Sanskrit and they understand the Shastra and they, they know the philosophy, but for business. You know, they know that people also want these things. Anyone here from Kerala? No. So, you know, it's a thriving business there. These people who do, you know, what we call in the North, jadu, <laughs> you know, black magic, and, you know, you need to wipe out an enemy or two. And, you know, I mean, the, the, the priests in those places have big Rolls Royces and, uh, you know, armed escorts, and it's, it's pretty frightening, actually. 
<clears throat> so this materialistic, when the Brahman has become contaminated in this way, then that's the end of Varnashram Dharma, and then it ceases to be Varnashram Dharma, and instead it becomes the caste system. I think. So a person has to be unmotivated. This is the point. We were talking about the purity of motivations earlier. That's, I think, something to consider there. But Krishna, is, he's accommodating everybody. He doesn't discourage the demigod worship, he just, he, but he does make it very clear that this is for less intelligent people. So a person has to be honest and progressive and keep good association and do the right thing. Is that okay? Any other questions? I have a question. Please. So, <coughs> Mahavishnu created uh, all these, uh, uh, for example, the demigods. All that, when he created, he defined the limitation for all the demigods. When a normal person go and break the demigods for something, I ask him that it's not his limitation, beyond his limitation. How come Mahavishnu go and ask him why you are going beyond the limitation? I'm not sure I understand that question. So a god, Mahavishnu, mm -hmm. he created all the demigods. Okay. Like Krishna did. Mm -hmm. So when he created the demigods, I assume he had, a, he defined their limitations. It means the, he defined the duties. What is the job? Right? Okay, got it. Okay. So what is their job description? That's, yeah. So I go there <coughs> and uh, ask, write the god yeah. Shiva and ask him to go beyond his uh, defined duty. Yeah. So how well, come Krishna knows very well. You have to consider that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is Sarvajna. He knows everything. He knows that there is a class of persons who are never going to accept me on my terms. They won't even accept me on their terms. They will, they will only accept someone else on their terms. Therefore, I have to fulfill that desire. I have to supply someone who can at least elevate them to some degree somehow and you know under my authority it's it's, it's kind of like you know <laughs> i'm sorry to say that even in Vrindavan, when you drive down the national highway you see these little you know, uh, you know deshi deshi sharab what do they call it <laughs> sarkari take off deshi sharab <laughs> you know the government knows that there are going to be people who are alcoholics and they have to somehow accommodate it, otherwise it gets way out of hand. As in fact it's, it's already becoming by dint of being called yoga. I mean, they tried that in this country as well. You know? Prostitution is the same similar thing. The police everywhere, anywhere in the world, they, they tolerate a certain level, but as soon as it gets beyond that, they, they, they put their feet down and, you know, reasonable. You have to be practical. So Krishna is also very practical. He knows that there are people here who are never going to worship me no matter what I do, no matter how nice I am. They just, you know, that's where they're at. He's got to accommodate them and, and, and give the job description to these devathas to somehow elevate them as best as can be done. Is that clear? Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Can I request? Yeah, please. Any one of my monthly class students who ask questions? Because when we have Wednesday, you're always asking the questions. <laughs> now you should ask Prabhu the questions. I have one question. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, uh, you mentioned that karma is dharma. Yes. So, is it that we are will be doing proper karma if we do, we are engaged in religious activity? That's correct. And if we are not engaged in religious activity and we are just performing our duty, which is to study and gain knowledge. Well, your duty, you know, if, if you're doing your duty as it is enjoined in Shastra, then that is dharma. And if you're not doing what the Shastra tells you to do, then that is adharma or, vi, or vikarma. Krishna describes this in chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita. In chapter 16, Krishna describes what topic? Who knows? He talks about the godly natures that men have or the demoniac natures that men have, and uh, he tends to spend a little more time talking about the demoniac natures. But at the end of his discussion, he says something very interesting. Here he says, uh, one should avoid three gates that lead to hell. What are those three gates? Who knows? Lust, Lust anger, greed. Ah, so he says, one should do that thing which is shreyas. There are two things mentioned in the Upanishads. 
and repeated throughout the entire gamut of Sanskrit literature. They are Shreyas and Preyas. Shreyas, well, what does Preyas mean first? You can guess. Any linguists here? <laughs> the thing with Paramgitim. If someone gives up the injunctions of the Shastra and acts just whimsically or independently, then that person gets neither happiness nor peace nor the supreme destination. Tasmat chastam pramanam te karya karya vyavasthitao nadva shastra vidhanoktam karma kartum iharhasi. Therefore, you should do your karma on the basis of what is stated in the Shastra Vidhis. We talked about Vidhi Purvakam before. That's what he's getting at. And you should, uh, uh, on the basis of the, of the Pramana, of the Shastra, the evidence of the Shastra, you should understand and discriminate what is to be done and what is not to be done. So really what you're asking is, what is my dharma, in effect? And this is the same question that Arjun asks in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. He said, I'm dharma samurha cheta. In these circumstances, it's so heavy, this, this context in which Arjun was dealing with on the battlefield, having to fight with people that he loved and respected. He said, this is so heavy for me, I, I don't know what to do. I'm dharma samurha cheta. I am completely bewildered as to what my duty is in this context. And life is like that. That's why Bhagavad Gita was spoken on a battlefield. A mother-in-law teaches the daughter-in-law by teaching her own daughter. <laughs> you see? And Krishna teaches all of us through teaching Arjuna. And on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Arjuna was bewildered as to what his duty is, and therefore he surrendered to Krishna and accepted Krishna as his guru. This is why in the human form of life we need gurus. If we are concerned about these things seriously enough to actually do something about it, to actually modify our behavior, then we are going to need guidance for that. Sometimes people come to me and they want to learn Sanskrit. <laughs> and, you know, they think that they're going to do it with a book, but you're going to have so many questions if you try to do it on your own. It's to, you need a teacher for everything. You think? So, the real thing is, what is my duty? And for that reason, we have to at least have some grasp on the content of Bhagavad Gita, but we also need to have a very qualified guide who can explain it to us. Just like when you go to college, you're studying biology, but you also need a teacher. And that teacher has credentials, and there's a curriculum that's either accredited or not, and it's like that in spiritual life. It's, spiritual life is difficult enough already. Why would, why would it be more difficult than it needs to be? All these things are there to help us. Is that clear? Okay. I have a question. Yeah, please. Is the Dharma always the same in all the, all the Yugas? Oh, very good question. This is a very good question. Now, Dharma is such a thing that it is very, very difficult to describe. What is the definition of Dharma? Let's see. Raise your hands. Who knows what does Dharma mean? You know what I found in Sanskrit? The, the easy words that everybody knows are actually the hardest words that nobody knows. <laughs> dharma means... What? Natural. Truth. Faith. Truth. Faith. Natural what else? Disposition. Huh? A natural disposition. A natural disposition. What else? Duty. 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 Anything else? Essential quality. Essential quality. What? I was going to say duty. Yeah. Obligation. Ethics. All these things. We hear all these things are translating one word. So uh, these are very different things. But they're not different things. Because that is the concept of dharma that is missing in 90% of the world if not 99%. Dharma is a very difficult thing to understand. So, one subset of this general concept we can call sadharana dharma, which means all these things at one and the same time. <coughs> a general concept is, uh, or a general subset of, uh, subset of general dharma, I should say, is that we have different kinds of dharma. We have swadharma. That is a specific social duty that I, as an individual, of a certain nature have to perform in the society. We have Varna Dharma, we have Ashram Dharma, and similarly we have Yuga Dharma. The concept of Yuga Dharma means in a particular age, if you want to elevate yourself in the best way, and especially in a spiritual way, you have got to do, perform what is so-called the Yuga Dharma. So uh, there's a nice verse in Srimad Bhagavatam that gives examples of the Yuga Dharma. Krite yajjayato vishnu, tretayam yajato machayhe. 
Dwap, uh, what is it? Dwapare uh, paracharyayam kalota dhari kirtana. That same benefit that people used to get in the Satya Yuga or the Krita Yuga by meditating for long, long years when they had that power of mental concentration, that benefit had to be modified for the next Yuga, Treta Yuga. People were expected instead that they offer very costly sacrifices with, you know, huge uh, fire sacrifices, Soma Yajnas and Ashrameta Yajnas and things like that. Very, very expensive. Gold was offered, ghee was offered, so many things that you can't even find nowadays. Uh, well, you can, don't even have pure elements anymore, isn't it? You try to drink some pure water and you, don't, you can't have any faith in that. So-called organic, it's all cheating, isn't it? <laughs> you all know this better than I do. We're all biologists, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, then in the Dwapara Yuga, instead the w direct worship of the Supreme Lord in the form of the deity was introduced. You see? And now in the Kali Yuga, we are so, our Adhikar is so meager now that it's said that Kalauta Dhari Kirtanat, simply Hari Kirtan. We simply perform what we call Sankirtana, chanting together like we were doing earlier, these names. And that will purify the heart. It will also enlighten the intelligence. It will create for the even physically auspiciousness. Everything becomes natural when you're situated in that which sustains us. Now, going over and above this question of yoga dharma, and so the answer, the quick answer to your question is yes, dharma changes in different ages. But we have to understand the universal descriptions of dharma or the universal aspects of dharma. There is one dharma that we all share. Even though each of us has our own separate, separate alagalag dharmas, right? Somebody may be a brahmana, somebody may be a housewife, someone else may be a... He's pulling a cart, right? <clears throat> no matter what, we're all doing different. We all have our own particular obligations. There's one thing that we all share, one dharma that we all shared. Who knows what that is? Savai pum sam paro dharamo yato bhakti rato. Ahaitugi apratihata yayat masu prasidati. Srimad Bhagavatam says that dharma that we all share, it's called paro dharma. And that is the spiritual, the, the, to act in our actual constitutional position, which approaches the definition that he gave. Dharma also means an, a, a, a thing's constitution. It's lakshana, it's swarup, you see? So, jiver shorupai krishna nito dash, Chaitanya Charitamrita says. The, the swarup of the living entity is to be the servant of God, you see? So that is something, here, here in Kali Yuga, in this Kali Yuga in particular, we're very, very fortunate because here, the Yuga Dharma and the Paro Dharma, they coalesce. They are one and the same thing. We are simply chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, 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 Hare Rama, 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 Hare Rama, Hare Hare, and we're becoming all auspicious in every way. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was taught uh, in six ways at least that we become all auspicious, and uh, furthermore we also awaken our dormant spiritual consciousness, and it can be done even in one life, even though it's Kali Yuga, even though everything is aimed against us. <laughs> it's, it's such a glorious process. It's a special dispensation been given for this age, as I mentioned earlier. Is that okay? Yeah. Anything else? Thanks. Yeah. So, Guruji, in your talk earlier, you mentioned about uh, if we satisfy the devata, if we please the devata, they will please them mm -hmm. by giving material benefits. Right. So if, we, if we look at the overall uh, picture of this material world, uh, the the part in the, in the eastern uh, part of the world where people tend to be more uh, you know, God conscious, they are they seem to be in poverty or <coughs> suffering. But mm -hmm. in the western part, they are very you know, affluent in you know, so many amenities, things like that. So can you please? Uh, <laughs> Well, there's a couple of things. There's, there's about half a dozen ways in which I could answer this question. I'm just going through my mind trying to figure out which one would be more fun. 
Srila Prabhupada was once asked a very similar question. He said that Prabhupada, you know, you're saying that this process and you're, you know, the, the, the people in India have always been doing this, but we see that people in India are suffering so much. And sometimes we look at the Americans, and particularly with regards to America, they were asking this question that, you know, Americans, they don't know anything and they're not following anything, but they're doing so well. So, you know, what goes? And Prabhupada answered in two words. Anybody know? Just wait. <laughs> it really is like that. If you've been around for several decades, then you will realize that um, actually even within one lifetime, a person can go through so many different states. Therefore, in the 10th canto, when the sons of Kuvera offered their prayers to Lord Damodar, after that Dhammabandhan Lila, they very insightfully addressed him as Sarva Kshetra Vikaravit, the person who knows all the changes that every living being has been through. <laughs> Uh, well, who is it? One of these blues singers, I think he used to. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> but Krishna knows these things. Um, so, uh, now, the, uh, now I've lost my train of thought. Maybe you should repeat your question. Uh, the oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. I remember now. <laughs> so, and as far as India goes, um, there's a couple of things here. I mean, uh, Prabhupada was asked this, and he also replied that the Indians are sinning in knowledge, and therefore the reactions are much worse. When a person doesn't know any better, then he can be excused. But when a person knows better and deliberately ignores what he knows is right, then the, the punishments will be a little bit heavier. That's something very strong to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've seen like that. It's, it's, it, it really is like that. In 1977, uh, Kumbh Mela Prabhupada was there, and one of my godbrothers told me that he was there with Srila Prabhupada. And he saw there was an Indian devotee, and this devotee had done something that was, you know, Prabhupada didn't approve. And Prabhupada chastised him severely roundly disciplined him uh, very, very strongly. And um, he was impressed at how, you know, how firm Prabhupada's chastisement was. And then he said what, what completely short-circuited his intelligence is that the very next day there was an American devotee who did the exact same thing. And Prabhupada saw this, or came to his attention, and, you know, the, the Prabhupada just said, well, you know, try to avoid it in the future. He was very lenient, you see? So he, he just gave me his personal feeling that, you know, he saw that there was a difference between the way that Prabhupada treated those who knew better and the, those who didn't know. And given the empathy that was characteristic of Srila Prabhupada, I think we, we were safe to assume that Prabhupada knew <laughs> who knew and who didn't know, you see? So that's one answer. I mean, now at the same time, you know, living in India, I can see that in some ways India's becoming more and more like the West, and in some ways America is also becoming more and more like India. I mean, you know, technologically India is, you know, has you know, great, come up a great deal, and uh, you know, in certain ways America has sunk to third world country status. You go into a government building, for example, and it just nothing works. In some places it's like that. So, you know, whether there's that great of a difference, I don't know. But the general principle is that we may be undergoing the reactions for our karma that, it, that we had performed billions of eons ago. So who's to say? <laughs> who's to say? But in general, it's, it's a safe thing to say that when, when someone is uh, deliberately uh, ignoring what he knows to be right and chasing after this illusory dream, and especially in sinful ways, then the reactions are going to be a little strong. Now, shall I tell you a story? Anybody know about the Himalayas uh, two years ago, I think it was? They had floods there. Do you know the backstory? There was a temple, and I don't remember the details exactly, the Temple of Kali Ma. And some 15 or 20 years ago, they tried to move the deity to widen the road. And the deity didn't want to move. 
And so some, I don't, maybe somebody had a dream or something and the deity threatened him and said, you know, don't you, tra don't you dare. <laughs> and so they, they got spooked and they, they, they backed off. So then again, you know, the developers being developers, they, they got the same idea about 20 years later. And this time, you know, Kali Yuga has advanced in two decades in India. You know how much it's advanced in the last two decades in India. So he didn't listen. And that night, at midnight, after they'd moved the deity, the entire place was wiped out. The entire place was wiped out with the floods, buried in mud. <laughs> you see? So, Daivi Hyesha Gona Mai, Mama Maya Duratyaya, Krishna says. This Maya, you do not underestimate the potency of this Maya. She is so powerful. So, you know, speaking of demigods, we can go through a few verses that appear in the Brahma Samhita. Srishti sthiti pralaya sadhana shakti reka chayva yasya bhuvanani vibhariti durga. Ichanu rupam api yasya cheshtate sa govindam adi purusham tamaham bhajami. This Devi Durga, who is uh, the adhikarini in charge of creation and maintenance and dissolution, she is but the shadow of the Supreme Lord. In fact, she. She keeps a low profile in front of the Supreme Lord because she's ashamed of the work that she has to do. She has to monitor all these filthy people and take care of their problems, Durga Devi. So she has a great deal of shyness about that. But she performs her functions in accordance with the will of Govinda. This is stated in the Brahma Samhita. It says that Lord Shiva, her husband, he's a little bit like yogurt. <laughs> Lord Shiva's, in the Shastra we find statements are there, in which Lord Shiva is called Maheshwara, for particularly if you read Shvetashvatara Upanishad, it would appear that Lord Shiva is the Supreme. And that's Shruti Mantra, not Smriti. So, <clears throat> what about that? And the idea here is that, uh, it's explained in Brahma Samhita, that just as milk and yogurt are simultaneously the same thing and yet different things, so in the same way, Lord Vishnu and Lord Shiva, they're simultaneously the same, but they're different. Lord Shiva comes in direct contact with Maya. She's his wife. <laughs> See? Therefore, he's like curdled Vishnu. <laughs> when you add tamarind into milk, then the milk will curdle. Every, every cook knows. And similarly, when, you, when Vishnu contacts his material energy, then he's no longer Vishnu. At that time, he assumes this new function as Shiva. And uh, his, he's a partial uh, plenary manifestation of the Lord. Uh, but he's no longer Vishnu Tattva. He has morphed into Shiva Tattva in exactly the same way that milk becomes yogurt. What's another one? Surya. Raja. He's the king of all the planets. Uh, everybody knows we all depend on the sun to live. Without the sun, we're all finished. <laughs> and there's no life possible in this world without the sun. So he's burning in the sky with a Shesha Teja, infinite power. But he carries out his regular duty, I mean clockwork. <laughs> we do set our clocks by the sun's movements. That is how diligent he is in his dharma. Think about that. <laughs> you know, somebody sent me a very interesting quote, and I, the, you know, kids don't try this at home, but um, it was a quote from one obscure Smriti Shastra that actually gave some grounds, some, some uh, validation of the process of suicide, ritual suicide. It said that if you ever get to the condition in which it is impossible for you to perform your prescribed duty, then it is permissible to fast into death. Because the obvious implication here is that it's preferable to die than it is to neglect your prescribed duty. So when you're so pakka that you never ever fail in your duty, then you can become the sun. And in Brihadana Upanishad, 
there's a statement there, this, the sage Vama, Vamadev, he got this stunning realization, my God, I can see now how I was once the sun. <laughs> once I was Manu, once I was the sun, now look at me. <laughs> see? We don't know who we are. Yes, Yajnaya. He performs his duty in accordance to his submission to Govinda. So we have Panchopasana. Amongst the Smartas, there are five deities that we worship. Uh, Vishnu, Shiva, Durga, uh, uh, Surya, and also Ganesh. Yet Pada Pallava Yugam Vinidhaya Kumbha Dvandve Pranama Samaye Sagaradhirajaha Viktan Vihantum Alam Asya Jagatrayasya Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bhajami. This uh, Ganesh, uh, where does he get his potency? He's called Prathama Pujya. We worship him first. Why? Because he's Vigneshwara. He can remove the obstacles. Right? So where does he get the potency to remove these obstacles? Because he worships Lord Narasimha Dev. And he keeps the feet of Narasimha Dev upon his head, and he's empowered to perform this function by Lord Narasimha Dev. All this information is coming from Sri Brahma Samhita. Now, where does Brahma Samhita come from? Have you made it up? It is somebody in Bengal wrote it in the 16th century. Where does it come from? Who knows the answer? You know the answer. Tiruvattura. Anybody from Kerala? She's from Kerala, the region. The Tamil Nadu, that's extreme south. Kanyakumari district. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited this temple of Adi Keshava, big Mahavishnu, as you were saying earlier. Famous temple. And he found that the pundits in that area, they were all studying this book, Brahma Samhita, in which these verses are found. It is not just Hare Krishna ideology. <laughs> or if it is, it, it, it was in, all, in a distant corner, for the, as far as possible from Bengal, 500 years ago even. That means that this understanding was previously much more widespread than it is now. I mean, people nowadays, they don't ask to understand anything. They ask, whose father was Sita again? <laughs> <laughs> you actually get questions like this now. It's amazing. I mean, I've seen the, the difference in the questions that were asked a, a generation or two ago. <laughs> I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. <laughs> anyway, so we've covered all the bases, haven't we? All, each of these five demigods are mentioned there in the Shastra, and, and Bhagavad Gita is also very clear. I've given you the evidence. Prabhupada has uh, paraphrased a nice verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. As you water the root of a tree, and that water will be disseminated throughout the entire tree to all the branches, all the leaves, and even the flowers and fruits, and even into the new seeds that will produce new trees. You see? In exactly the same way, when we worship Vishnu, then automatically that the benefit is shared amongst the entire creation and all the living entities who are empowered by Vishnu. Everybody has his dharma. And here dharma means not only the duty, but the intrinsic nature, adi, adi, adi. All the things that we've described already. And that is conferred upon every living entity by the Supreme Lord Govinda. Whether you are a demigod, or a human being, or an Indragopa insect, or a germ, whatever potency you have, whatever nature you have, it has been invested within you by this Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is the idea. So these demigods are actually just highly empowered living entities who, by dint of their good karma, they have risen to that high level. But they are not independent of the Supreme. They depend on Him in all circumstances. It's the, when we do yajnas, what is the last thing we say? Shri Krishna Arpanamastu. Have you heard this? Why, why, why Krishna? Why Krishna? Unless it's understood. What is the Mangala Ghat there? What is the Mangala Ghat it's sitting in the yajna uh, uh, arena signified. Does anyone know? Yajneshwara, Lord Varaha Dev, Vishnu. Yajno Vai Vishnu. This is Shruti Mantra again. The Supreme Lord is Vishnu. So many places we, we have these uh, authoritative statements. 
but people don't read them anymore. That's why they, they don't even know whose father Sita is. <laughs> they don't know. So, you know, Parhe <laughs> Lekelo, they know. And, uh, and, you know, those who are really serious devotees, they know. Uh, I've mentioned already, even the Karmakandiya Pandits, who by dint of the embarrassment of their family situation are obliged to cheat people, uh, in effect, I mean, I, this is harsh words, I should take that back. They're, they're doing pious, pious work, but it's mundane, and they, they're withholding something that they know to be more valuable, this is the point, for personal motivations. Anyway, uh, I think I should stop here. You have a question, please. Uh, yes, just going back to what you said about uh, dharma and finding your dharma. Yeah. Uh, to what extent does do modes of passion play in you know helping you find oh, what it is that question. you're supposed to do in life, and that you may very very good question. Do it in the mode of goodness. Yeah, you know, Srila Prabhupada on occasion used to say sometimes that the. Fourteenth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is actually the most important chapter. Does anybody know what the topic of the fourteenth chapter is? The three modes of material nature. So he's asking, you know, how does how do these modes, I think, um, impact with our ability to find our dharma or perform our own dharma? Very good question. I'm going to just quickly read a few things that are very uh, powerful here. Krishna says, material nature consists of three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. When the eternal living entity comes in contact with nature, O mighty armed Arjun, he becomes conditioned by these modes. O sinless one, the, the, the mode of goodness being more pure than the others is illuminating. It frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in, you should read into this, Parantu. <laughs> but those situated in that mode become conditioned by a sense of happiness and knowledge. And when you know more than anybody else, what do you get? What do you become? Proud. proud. You get complacent and proud, and we know from the Bible, pride precedeth the fall. <laughs> you see? So that's the weakness of the mode of goodness. It's illuminating, it's elevating, but it has these defects. The mode of passion, on the other hand, is born of unlimited desires and longings, O son of Kunti, and because of this, the living entity is bound to material, fruitive actions. In other words, he's totally distracted, totally wound up in his pursuits, and just doesn't have time to hear or notice. You see? Too busy. This is something that we experience very prominently in today's world, isn't it? They just don't have time. Tamastu. Now, on the other hand, we have tamokana. What does this signify? Ajnana janvidhi, mohanam sarvadehinam, pramada alasya nidrabhis, tannibasnati bharata. O son of Bharata, know that the mode of darkness, born of ignorance, is delusion of all embodied living beings. The results of this mode are madness, indolence, and sleep, which bind the conditioned soul. I should add in today's world, depression. Depression is tamoguna. It's not, it's not productive. So we have to be aware of those things. Now, the mode of goodness conditions one to happiness, passion conditions one to fruit of action, and ignorance covering one's knowledge binds one to madness, or darkness at any rate. Sometimes the mode of goodness becomes prominent, defeating the modes of passion and ignorance. Sometimes the mode of passion defeats goodness and ignorance. Other times ignorance defeats both goodness and passion. In this way, there's always, they're always vying for supremacy. I mean, this is a long answer. Do you have time? Yes. It's, it's, it's good to know these things. The manifestation of the mode of goodness can be experienced when all the gates of the body are illuminated by knowledge. You're light, you're aware. Jnana. Jnana doesn't actually mean knowledge. It means what? Literally, those who have learned by lectures know I, I emphasize this. Awareness. Awareness. Gya. Gya means to be aware. So that's sattva guna. Oh, chief of the Bharatas, when there's an increase in the amount of passion, the symptoms of great attachment, fruit of activity, intense endeavor, and uncontrollable desire and hankering develop. 
Now listen to this, it gets more interesting. When there is an increase in the mode of ignorance, O son of, o son of Kuru, darkness, inertia, madness, and illusion are manifested. When one dies in the mode of goodness, he attains the pure higher planets of the living beings. When one dies in the mode of passion, he takes birth among those engaged in fruitive activities. That's called horizontal progress, <laughs> as opposed to vertical progress. And when one dies in the mode of ignorance, he takes birth in the animal kingdom, and that's not progress. So, the result of pious action is pure and is said to be sattvic, or in the mode of goodness. Action done in the mode of passion results in, who knows, misery, distress, in this world. And action in the mode of ignorance results in foolishness. So when you, when you, when you chase after your desires and are only focused on that, you're ultimately going to cause yourself a lot of suffering. But when you're acting in knowledge and doing the right thing in knowledge, then you not only have your needs met in a way that you're satisfied with because you're sattvic, <laughs> but you are elevated in the next life. And when you do neither of those things, you just tune out, space out, and just, uh, what, is the, what do we call this in colloquial terms, uh, just to blow it off, <laughs> then you go down, you go down, to, into animal species even. Sadvat sanjayate jnana. Awareness, it is produced out of sattva. Rataso lobha evacha, greed is produced out of passion. Pramada mohao tamaso, the illusion has, uh, you know, madness and, and bewilderment. Uh, these, these are some of the ideas here. So, when one properly sees that in all activities no other performer is at work than these modes of nature, and he knows the Supreme Lord who is transcendental to all these modes, he attains my spiritual nature. When the embodied being is able to transcend these three modes associated with the material body, he can become free from birth, death, old age, and disease, and their distresses, and can enjoy nectar, even in this life. Now, here's a very interesting verse. O son of Pandu, he who does not hate illumination, attachment, or delusion when they are present, nor long for them when they disappear, who is unwavering and undisturbed through all these reactions of the material qualities, remaining neutral and transcendental, knowing that the modes alone are active, who is situated in the self and regards alike happiness and distress, who looks upon a lump of earth, stone, or piece of gold with equal eye, who is equal toward the desirable and the undesirable, who is steady, situated equally well in praise and blame, honor and dishonor, who treats alike both friends and enemies, and who has renounced all material activities, such a person is said to have transcended the modes of material nature. Now, he tells us how do we do this. This is a, the real point. One who engages in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. That's liberation. So to answer the easy answer to your question is very simple. By practicing this Bhakti Yoga system, especially through chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare We are first elevated to the mode of goodness, and in that uh, fortunate position of goodness, when we accept the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, as I told her earlier, then he can guide us in practical matters, including all other dharmas. But we have to emphasize the importance of Paro Dharma for two reasons. Number one is that it, it keeps us in the safest position of sattva guna, because that is the natural effect of bhakti yoga. But the second one is actually even more important. When our motive is pure, when we are only interested in love, pure love, unmotivated, unselfless, uninterrupted love, then we will not exploit anyone else and we will not be exploited by anyone else. 
We will not misuse the opportunity of the human form of life. It will not degrade into what the caste system became when people ignored this spiritual principle. In other words, as Bill Mangala Thakur said very eloquently, he wrote a nice poem. Uh, let me see if I can remember now. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, I don't remember, but he said that when our minds are fixed on Krishna, he said, only then can we give stern thought to philosophy, sensitive thought to literature, and ceaseless thought to our duties. Only when our minds are fixed in, in love, in purity with, for Krishna. That is what we're seeking. This is the, this is the parodharma, the, the essential property of the self that we're all chasing after, looking for it in others, maybe trying to find it in ourselves, but it doesn't exist in this world. <laughs> we have to get out of this world in order to experience it. That's a very long answer. I hope it's helpful. <laughs> yeah, you have something? In certain places back in India, in addition to our chanting, there is something called Hare Kalki, Hare Kalki, Kalki Kalki, Hare Hare. Oh, I've never heard that yet. Yeah. <laughs> it must be Bengal. <laughs> I, I don't know. So, no, I'm from Tirupati, so I've seen okay. certain places. Very interesting. Yeah. So, how, should we practice that or something? Well, where is it coming from? Mantra actually means it's got to be coming in the, in the Shastras. And this Hare Krishna Mantra is in fact, not only in the Shastra, it's in the Shruti Mantra. Kali Santana Upanishad says, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Iti Shodashakam Nam Nam, Kali Kalmashanashanam, Nataha Paratoropayo, Sarvavedeshu Drishyate. If you look throughout all the Vedas, you will not find a more efficacious means of elevation in this Kali Yuga that has the potency to wipe out all the contamination that's so characteristic of this age. You will not find anything more. Uh, efficacious than this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that we chant. So therefore Chaitanya Mahaprabhu emphasized this and we're chanting this for hundreds and hundreds of years people are doing this. So many other ideas come and go but you know they're not significant as Prabhupada said they're like bubbles in the ocean. You want the real thing that's coming from the Shastra especially if it's in Shruti Mantra that's eternal. So Why did they add Rama and then we are worshipping only Krishna? No, Rama is also Krishna. Rama means Radha Ramana. Ramana means to the enjoyer. And Rama means the enjoyer. So, Radha Ramana. That's one way to put it. Actually, Prabhupada, many times people ask this question. Hari Rama, what does it mean? Does it mean Balaram? Does it mean Ramchandra, Raghava? Does it mean Parashuram? There are so many Ramas. <laughs> and basically the answer is that you decide. <laughs> If you love the Lord in the form of Ramchandra, then that's fine. If you love him as Krishna, that's also fine. If you love him as Parashuram or Balaram, Tigrahega. <laughs> like in the Arit, we should understand the Siddhanta, the Shastra Siddhanta. The philosophical conclusion is that the origin of all these forms is Krishna. Rupa Goswami wrote a nice book to emphasize this point. Based on all the different quotes that he took from all the Shastras, he put them in all one place, Lagu Bhagavatamritam, and Jiva Goswami also described. The Bhagavatam also says the same thing. Is that okay? Okay. Anything else? I have a yes, um, In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is saying, worship me and I'm the Supreme Lord, and even you worship Devatas, it's I mean, you worship devatas and you get temporary result, which is probably materialistic. Yeah, uh, for sure. And yes. you worship me, no need to worship any devatas. I'm, I can give you mm -hmm. what it is, right? And these devatas, uh, as he said, is different parts of his body. Why does he create these devatas and make people so confused and make them worship these devatas? Why not he be himself? Yeah. And why can't... Everyone worship like Krishna. Okay. And when I was in New York, we went to a program in upstate New York, and as we were driving down the highway, we saw this very ominous looking facility 
that was, you know, surrounded by, you know, multiple high barbed wire fences and very few windows in the buildings, guard towers with guns poking out of them everywhere. It was a maximum security prison, one of the biggest prisons in the country and one of the most dangerous prisons. Different people working there. There's the person, the warden who's in charge of the whole thing. There are the, you know, the, the, the floor inspectors perhaps, and there are guards, and there are the officers who bring something for you to eat, and there are so many things that, you know, it, it takes a lot to run a prison. There are many people working there. Each of them is an authority in his own right, and each of them represents the prison system. You see? So in the same way, in this material world, when we have misused our minute independence and tried to, in effect, compete with the Supreme Lord or, or even deny Him and, you know, end up with this false ego that obliges us to wander from one body to another, life after life, sometimes making horrible mistakes then the Lord has to do something to, 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 to somehow or other bring us back. And he, in fact, he not only does something, he does everything. He makes sure that within this world, there are, there are people who can help us. There are living beings who can help us, no matter what level we are on. And as I said with regard to his question, if, if we want to deny the Supreme Lord's existence, or if we at least want to ignore his existence, and we're steadfast in that desire. And we might, may not even be aware of it, because in case you haven't noticed, in human society, people often don't know what they want. You see? Then he's, he's going to facilitate that, and he will send someone who can take care of us in that way. That's what these devatas are for. We're not prepared to deal directly with Krishna or his devotees, because that's too direct, and we don't want to go there. It's a psychological state that we can get into. It's a, it's a devotional state also. But uh, therefore we have to come into this material world and therefore there's somebody who has to manage this material world and keep tabs on us and check us, you know, make sure that we're okay and have everything we need. You see? Devatas serve that purpose. When a person is very pure and very well motivated also, and pious, but does not necessarily want to escape from this material world. That person may take birth as such, such a devata. And there are, you know, we talk about 33 koti demigods, but there are actually, even that, is only classes of demigods. Within that, those categories, there are so many people working under them called upadevatas. They're ethereal beings, you can't see them, but they're here. And they, they, they monitor our karma for us, and they, they, they supply all the necessities of life, as we were saying, all these things. It's in exactly the same way that the state does not prefer to have criminals, but anticipates that they will exist, because that's the way life is. In exactly that way, Krishna does not encourage us to worship devatas, or to uh, flee from him, or turn away from him. But he's got to accommodate those people who have done that. Does that answer your question? Why? Maybe you can rephrase the question. I am not 100% convinced. Um, it? it seems counterproductive that you know, he's going to... Yeah, I mean, <coughs> my question is, if, if Supreme God, Krishna is saying that I'm the Supreme, Supreme God, and you can uh, praise me, or you can, you know, uh, ask me whatever you want, and I can give you, and you don't have to go to there with us mm -hmm. and ask them and get a temporary pleasure out of them. Uh, why, if that is the case, and that, that's what is preached in Bhagavad Gita, why did he have these many avatars? And why did, why did he change the Dharma? And why did he even create these devas? Mm -hmm. And why did he make people uh, reach those devatas, and why do people pray these days? Why can't they pray in just Krishna? And he also well, says yeah. that only intellectual people know that. 
Supreme Lord as Krishna and people who worship Devadas, they are not intellectual people in a way. Well, you're saying a lot of things, and they're not all necessarily the same thing. Um, so maybe that's a different way of saying that you've got a few questions. Uh, regarding the last point you made, that Krishna says that the jnani, jnani plat maiva mematam, that's what you're thinking. Um, he does say that I'm particularly fond of the jnani because of all those people who approach him with material motivations, the jnani is, on, is the most subtle of them. He's the most selfless and elevated of them. And, but he doesn't at all say that they're the only ones, because he says in other places as well that anybody who takes shelter of me, you know, whether he's low-born or whether he, whatever he is, you know, everybody can attain the supreme destination. The point is that we don't want to do that. And um, that's why we evade the Lord or his representatives. There are only two things that we can do in this world once we've made the decision to come here, which is, again, our decision. We can either try to exploit the Lord or his resources, or we can try to <coughs> evade the Lord or his representatives. And those two poles are called bhoga and tyaga, or sometimes we call them karma and jnana. When we come to bhakti, bhakti is in a transcendental category above each of those. It's activity and it's awareness and feeling, but it's of a transcendental nature, selfless nature. So you can't, you know, bhakti is not necessarily the same thing as karma. If we have decided to evade bhakti as well as the Lord, then we are, we are within the karmic paradigm that Durga manages. And Durga will uh, arrange that, you know, we have to suffer and enjoy according to the results of our own actions. But it, the, the choice is always, you know, the ball is always in our court and that we always have the choice what to do in a particular circumstance. Now, our choices are conditioned, and that's a very, very, very important point, that a person who is born in a family, uh, you know, of alcoholics in the worst part of town where he's surrounded by gang members, and is given no, you know, has no money or facility to advance in life, that person is very strongly, you know, inclined to, to mess up his life in a major way, right? And a person who's born in a very good facility, say in, 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 a, in a family of pure Brahmins, who are, you know, also very saintly, and, yeah, I mean, there's many kinds of people in this world. So the facilities that we have, they do impact us and therefore it's important to, to monitor our own progress and to keep our own uh, house in order karmically, so to speak. But the fact is that the decision to actually turn to Krishna or to turn to God in, in Bhakti Yoga, that is existing in all times, places and circumstances and it can be done in all times, places and circumstances but generally we're overwhelmed and don't want to. As he was saying earlier, um, you know, in the mode of passion, we just don't want to go there because we've got our sights set on something else. In the mode of ignorance, we're so covered over that we can't even understand or we can't even see uh, the benefit of what's being presented here, you see. We're very strongly conditioned by these lower modes of material nature, and that's why we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna describes the coverings of these three modes in three ways in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, who knows what I'm thinking about? Dust on the mirror. I'm sorry? Dust on the mirror? Yeah. The, the, you know, it's like smoke covering a fire. Well, dust covering a mirror, smoke covering a fire, or a womb covering an embryo. Those are all different coverings, but they're not the same at all. The dust on the mirror, you just have to wipe it clean, you can see a clear reflection. You see? Smoke, fire and smoke, that's a little harder. You've got to put out the fire first and get rid of the smoke. Then you can see what's going on. A embryo in a womb, nowadays they have that technology, but it's, it's even harder than... Um, you see my point? You see, so no matter what mode you're in, you can develop transcendental knowledge, but you've, you've got to take to the process of bhakti in order to do that, because practically speaking, nothing else really works in this age. We don't have the adhikar. So as to why Krishna has arranged it like this, well, maybe Krishna didn't arrange it. Maybe it's our arrangement, and he's just trying to make the best use of the, of, of the mess that we've created. That takes humility. <laughs>
you know, to to accept that. I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so, is Buddha an avatar of Vishnu? Yes. Okay. So, the Buddha philosophy is basically the impersonalist philosophy. Voidist. Uh, pardon? It's impersonalist, but it goes a step beyond impersonalism to, I mean, nihilistic, voidism. Okay. So... Atheistic uh, also. Okay. So, in, uh, in uh, Gita, we often get this word that uh, Krishna in fact says that even though a person is an impersonalist, mm. he finally has to reach the bhakta stage and reach me. Uh, am I right? That's what I read in... Well, you know, it depends on your desire. This is, you know, when we're talking about bhakti yoga, we're talking about love. And all is fair in love and in war. <laughs> so when you're when you're talking about love, it's not a top-heavy relationship in which only God matters and we don't matter. As far as He's concerned, from His vantage point, we're the ones who matter. <laughs> you see? Yeah. It's, it's a fifty-fifty deal. So if we want, we can remain with this conception that, that the Supreme is ultimately impersonal. And we can stay that way as long as we want to. Yeah, but uh, when one wants to or one has to reach Krishna, mm. he has to reach the stage of bhakta and then only he can reach Krishna. Bhaktyamam abhijanati, Krishna says. Bhaktyatvana nyaya shakya aham evam vidhojana. So many places throughout the Gita Krishna confirms. If you want to understand me as Bhagavan, then you've got to become a devotee. Okay. So why Srila Prabhupada the, always say that impersonalist philosophy is dangerous? Yeah. Why can't he state, if you're being an impersonalist, let it be, but this is good. This yeah. is what is bona fide. Yeah. Yeah. Why does he kind of criticize? I feel it's yeah. kind of criticism. Oh, very strongly criticized. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And uh, in some of the phrases in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna himself says that don't uh, unnecessarily go and prick people mm. who doesn't follow this. Mm -hmm. Leave them to their, better leave them to their own. That's right. Karma. Why does Srila Prabhupada... He, he says that in the context of karma, but in chapter 12, which is maybe what you're thinking of, Krishna actually gives them a certain degree of credulity there, even the impersonalists. He, he acknowledges that it's a bona fide path. And here's where we have to use a little discrimination, because if you will notice, Srila Prabhupada uses the terms, sometimes he uses the terms impersonalist and mayavadi um, interchangeably. The reason he does that, I think, I can't really say, but it seems to me that the reason he does that is because in today's world, practically anybody who is an impersonalist is at least to some degree influenced by the philosophy of Shankaracharya, although it's been modified since uh, the 7th century considerably. I mean, nowadays, what, what we know as Hinduism is largely the product of you know, a half dozen or more uh, very prominent reformers of Hinduism in the 19th century. People like Judu, you know, well, not Judu Krishnamurti, but uh, Annie Besant and, uh, you know, Aurobindo Ghosh and, you know, Swami Vivekananda and, uh, you know, Tilak and, you know, Sahajanand and, uh, not Sahajanand, but the Dayananda Saraswati and others. They're the ones who have invented modern Hinduism, and they have done so on the basis of the privileging of the Shankara philosophy that was uh, standard amongst British scholars at that time. There's a scholar in Illinois named David Haberman who wrote a book about, well, he's written many books, but in one of his books he describes that there's a, there are very dubious reasons that the Europeans in particular privileged the position of Advaita, Keval Advaita philosophy of Shankaracharya. One of which is that there was a nascent nationalist struggle going on at that time in the 19th century, and that was a, a prick, as you said, for the, for the British, for the British Raj. It was very difficult for them to deal with that. So they wanted to emphasize 
a, a, a traditional Hinduism that negates the world so utterly that it removes the political threat from anybody who subscribes to that philosophy. So they're the ones who actually put Shankaracharya front and center to a large degree, not exclusively, but to a large degree. And having, having done that, every other stamp of a uh, spiritual practice, at least among the impersonalists in modern day India, it is certainly marked by and pernicious about impersonalism. And that is that uh, ultimately the ideology denies the validity of the personal form of the Supreme Lord. And that is an offense. It ultimately says that all of Krishna's wonderful qualities and activities and pastimes, it's all coming from within the realm of Maya. It's, it may be sattva guna maya, but still it's maya. It, in other words, it's an, an illusion. <coughs> the, the, the Shankara's philosophy is uh, Brahma Satya Jagan Mithya, which means that they're, the only thing real is Brahma, this impersonal reality. And everything else is maya, including Krishna, including the Acharyas, including devotional service, including anything that, that has any degree of duality. And that's very bad. And so Prabhupada when he is bashing impersonalists indiscriminately. That's probably the reason why. However, having said all of that, we should be a little more discriminating and we should know that there is a very important difference between impersonalists and mayavadis. Ideally, at least in, print, in, in, in theory, there is a very important difference. Not every impersonalist is an offender in this way. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also said, Mayavadi shunane bhashya hai sharvanash. Everything is ruined if you hear this Mayavadi bhashya. But not all impersonalists are Mayavadis, but all Mayavadis are impersonalists. <laughs> right? It's just like not all, not all sings are sardars, but all sardars are sings. <laughs> <laughs> you see, so not all impersonalists are Mayavadis. There's, and, you know, Krishna, and uh, if you really pressed him for it, I'm sure Srila Prabhupada also would, would accommodate that. But the fact of the matter is that about 90% of the time they are Mayavad. Either Mayavad directly, or more likely they're, they're at least influenced by Mayavad, and, and that, it, it's a very offensive tendency. That's why he's constantly hammering on them. Is that satisfactory? Yeah, and I have one more. <laughs> so it says that uh, I have it, and I'm. I have taken, I've chosen this book because it says Bhagavad Gita as a piece. And I started reading it. So when I start reading it, I come through many times Mayavadi impersonalist, which I really doesn't know, even yeah. before reading this. Yeah. So I kind of felt the meaning of the uh, uh, every sloka in Bhagavad Gita if given in a direct way, simple way, wouldn't wouldn't it be more easy for a person like that to understand <coughs> rather than comparing it to other philosophies? Yeah, this is a question of individual adhikar. And you know, when you're talking about individual adhikar, you can't generalize. Because it's not general, it's individual. Yeah, there, are, I, there are all different levels of adhikar, and these books are going to all of them, and it's very, very hard to say what, you know, what the general adhikar of the modern uh, day and age is. Mm -hmm. I mean, this Bhagavad Gita, unlike every other edition, even those that I read before I came to ISKCON, mm -hmm. this Bhagavad Gita only has made thousands and thousands of devotees worldwide. I think that that's because it represents the true spirit of the text, and people see that. Krishna's purpose is to get Arjun to fight. There are many ways to read Bhagavad Gita. There are many ways you can interpret this, but at the end of the day, he's going to fight. Thus, and in the same way, you know, the, the, the purport of the Bhagavad Gita is also very clear. Krishna says twice, man mana bhava mad bhakto, man yaji, man namaskuru, ityadi. Be, be a devotee, a straight, he says it. So Prabhupada calls it uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is because he's allowing Krishna to actually say that. There are some additions, and Prabhupada criticizes them, that, you know, when the commentator reads that particular verse, he actually make, he has the gall to say that Krishna doesn't mean that you should surrender to him, you should surrender to the, 
the, the, the, the unknown, you know, Krishna means dark, and dark means unknown, and unknown means the impersonal something, and I mean, that is twisting and twangling the text in a way that was not intended. Now, how do we understand what is the meaning of Bhagavad Gita according to the text? In the text itself, Krishna tells us, tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekchanti tad jnanam jnaninas tattva You go to the jnani, you serve that person, and you inquire from that person. So, if we take Krishna's advice at face value, and we hear from a representative of Krishna, a bona fide acharya, then we're going to get the message that Srila Prabhupada is presenting here. I know because I've read them. Sridhar Swami's tika is very clear. Baladevi Dabhushan's commentary is very clear. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary is very clear. Madhvacharya, Ramanuja Acharya, you can go all the way down the line. It's, con- it's completely consonant with what is being presented here in these Bhaktivedanta purports. I mentioned a moment ago that Prabhupada had quoted one verse. He didn't quote it. He paraphrased one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. How do I know that? Because I've read the Srimad Bhagavatam and I recognize the verse. People don't take the time to read these things. Therefore, they don't know. Therefore, we say Bhagavad Gita as it is because as it is means the way that Krishna intended it. And how do we know what Krishna intended except through the through his representatives, the predecessor Acharyas, at least for the last thousand years or so, this is what the Acharyas have taught. What more do you have, or, or, or what more can you ask for than that? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> I have one question. Yeah. I'm, I think that it might be out of context. Okay. But, um, so the Bhagavad Gita teaches us that Krishna Bhagwan is the Supreme Lord, and all the demi gods are his. Uh, Empowered agents, yeah, agents parcels. So, who Reverend supplies our need and uh, give us uh, immediate result. But um, our professor teaches us that um, the Brahma Bhagwan has the um, longest uh, uh, lifespan, okay. and all the other uh, demi gods does uh, have finite lifespan. That's right. So what happens uh, when all the demi gods lifespan is finished? Who takes care of us? <laughs> well, you know, when the demigods' lifespans are finished, we're also finished. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the same place that they go, especially if we worship them. <laughs> so aren't their uh, lifespans similar to Brahm, uh, same oh, no, as no. Brahma? They, they generally live much, much longer than we do. Yeah. But the point is that everybody's lifespan is limited in this world. It doesn't matter whether you're an ant or whether you're a demigod. You're going to die. And this is the point. I mean, we and the human species at this point in time, we live about, you know, between 50 and 100 years. That's about it. And higher planetary systems, they, they have longer lifespans, much, much longer. And even in this world, in previous yugas, they also had much longer lifespans. The whole universe is working, time is working in a cyclic fashion. It's not linear. Just as you have winter, summer, spring, winter, spring, summer, fall in the seasons in this world, and they just keep coming again and again with regularity, just like the sun. Yeah, I mean, I understand that yeah. you all are going to die. Yeah. But there will be people remaining on earth. And Brahma's lifespan is the, when the Kaluk will end. This one day will complete. I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Yeah, this but is all the demi gods have finite lifespan, and correct. their lifespan span will be completed before Brahmas. Correct. Still, still, there will be Kali going on. Well, no, no, <laughs> no they, they they live beyond Kali Yuga. Okay. Yeah, there are so many cycles I was mentioning. These just like the seasons. Every year you get all four seasons, but you live many years, right? Mm-hmm. And even beyond many years, you live many lifetimes, you see? And then there's somebody managing that whole process who lives longer than all of your lifetimes, yeah. you see? So it's, it's relative. That's why I was, in answer to her question, I was saying that, you know, there, there are relative adhikar in this world. So the adhikar of a tiny, tiny jiva who lives for 50 years in this world, and the adhikar of a brahma who lives for kalpas, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a bit different. 
So, you know, but the principle is easily understood that everybody has to die and even this whole creation, it winds up and goes dormant for some time, but then it comes back again and the whole thing all over again. Bhutva, bhutva, praviyate. Is that okay? So, you know, as long as there needs to be a place to accommodate prisoners, this material world will keep going on in that way. That this is a standard way that the world operates. But we can check out any time, and it's the perfection of life to do so, because we're going to suffer. You know, even if we go to Brahma Loka, Abrahma Puvana Loka Punavartin Arjuna, you know, a person still has to suffer, even in Brahma Loka, he still has to die, even if he takes birth of Brahma. This, the, the, on the absolute plane, it doesn't make any difference. There's only four things going on, birth, death, old age, disease. Whether your lifetime lasts a half an hour, or whether your lifetime lasts for the entire duration of the creation, it, it, you know, the principles are the same. Is that okay? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I have a question for you. So, I, um, <coughs> I work among uh, sophisticated scientists. I go lunch with them, mm -hmm. and they see what I eat, I see what they eat. <laughs> you know the obvious question I'm yeah. coming in. So, we are eating like that. Remain, I am asking, we are eating the meat and all those things. And I answer, meat, you know, we are killing an animal, there is a soul there, this other thing, this thing, everything is there, we are not supposed to eat. How come you are eating vegetables? You are a scientist, you know, even all the plants and everything has a soul there. Yeah. What type of explanation I should give them? You have to introduce the principle of what Madhvacharya calls Taratamya. Taratamya means hierarchy. There are certain life forms. We were discussing a moment ago demigods. You know, demigod is also, he's, he's eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. A demigod is also undergoing birth, death, old age, and disease. But the scale on which Brahma does this, and the scale on which we do this, they're not comparable. They're so vastly different, you see. So even within this microcosm of our own worldly existence, as we define the world in modern convention, you know, certain animals are more elevated than others. Certain life forms are considered to be more elevated. They're closer to taking birth as a human being. And the cow in particular is one of those, you know. So to interrupt, uh, you know, such a living being, uh, you know, to, to artificially step in and do something which is against your dharma, you know, it, it's going to mess up the system. It throws a wrench in the whole works. It has cosmic repercussions, everything that we do. And so this animal will have to come back and take birth again in order to, you know, finish out his sentence as, a, as, a, as an animal, you see? And the dem they're going to be, have to be demigods to administrate that whole process, so they've got to come back and do that thing all over again. It, it causes a big problem for so many others. What to speak of your own physical health, your financial health, your moral and spiritual health. The influence that your example has on those around you who see what you eat, you see? Social repercussions are also there. This is the point. Yeah, you want to add something? No, but I was just going to say after, this, after you finish, you can stop there and do okay. a and give them. Oh, uh, okay. Is that satisfying? I mean, it's a scientific situation we're talking about here, and you, you have to be aware of all the details in order to really make a convincing argument to a scientist. And that's why we invite you to, to, to attend these programs regularly and learn. So where does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita what to eat, what not to eat? Well, he says... Basically, I want to say I'm a vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not, not I mean, he, he doesn't talk about meat uh, so explicitly in Bhagavad Gita. That's dealt with elsewhere. But he does very clearly imply what is a tamasic diet as opposed to what is a sattvic diet. And he also uh, very clearly implies what he prefers. He said, when he says, patram pushpam palam toyam, you know, in other words, he's asking for a vegetarian diet, a sattvic diet. So these things are there very clearly in Bhagavad Gita. You know, if you want to get something explicit wherein the Shastra says, you know, do not eat meat, then you'll have to go to Manu Svaniti or some of the other Dharma Shastras that are specifically meant to actually get into that level of detail. But Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, they're meant to give us these fundamental principles. They, they don't get into all the nitty-gritty details. That's why Krishna says, if you go to a guru, he can do that for you. And you're doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah. So.
anything else? Otherwise, then we do kirtan. Okay. Thank you very much. All glory to Shri Prabhupada. <coughs> Thank you.